Hi, Quiva. Hey, Frank. It's, um, it's amazing to see you. Long time. A very long time. It's, it's only virtually, but still, you know, it's uh, so nice to see your face. Yeah, you too. Can't After so many that. years. Um, I wanted to talk to you uh, today because you are in Lisbon with the, in Portugal, with the Handana ship, which aims to break the naval, naval blockade of, of Gaza. Um, there's loads I want to talk to you about, but first I wanted to um, ask you very like simply in a way, uh, what's, what's the plan for the next few weeks, you know? The plan for the next few weeks is to continue what we've been doing for the last few weeks, um, which is basically a sail from port to port, um, from European port to port, um, and use the ship in a way as a form of floating advocacy. Um, so we dock, we coordinate with local coordination committees, Palestinian solidarity groups, the Palestinian diaspora community, um, and organize events, um, political lobbying. So we've been interfacing and meeting with a lot of uh, parliamentarians, uh, local city councils, um, and then the grassroots, which I think for all of us is really, yeah, the, the central tenet of this this mission. Um, so there's there's been a whole plethora of different activities, um, a lot of them artistic, so concerts, um, a lot of things, again, with the Palestinian community, um, activities with schools and children. Um, and, and as we go from port to port, try and shore and consolidate understanding and awareness um, of the necessity and urgency of challenging specifically the naval blockade, as well as more generally the genocide, the infanticide within the, the genocide, um, the hermetic siege, the sealing of Rafah. Um, so, so the mission um, started um, in Northern Europe and we're now in the Met. Um, so from Lisboa uh, tonight, we set sail to Malaga, um, and then to Denia, and then to Martigas. Uh, so there'll be a lot of stuff around Marseille and all the amazing organizers that are in Marseille. Um, and from Marseille to Hasio, then to Palermo, then to Malta, and then to Reza. Um, and at that point, when we dock in Malta, um, which will be in early August, there will be a coalescing of the other ships that we've been organizing through Break the Siege, which is another strand of the Freedom Flotilla um, Coalition, um, which will entail bigger ships um, with more robust humanitarian and medical aid on board, and then hundreds of human rights observers, observers um, medics, activists, members of parliament, etc. Um, but that is a more complex process because uh, we're in the process of getting the flags uh, or the ships reflagged in countries that are less susceptible to political pressure than those um, which happened in April, uh, and also to find ports of deportation uh, that that can ensure that we can onboard participants. Um, but for now, we're with the Handela, which is a beautiful wooden um, Norwegian ship, uh, which has a very small uh, crew and number of participants on board. It's just 15 to 17. Um, but people are getting off at some ports and then other people are joining. And there has been a beautiful diversity of representation from different geographical contexts, backgrounds, uh, movements, um, and a really solid captain and crew, uh, our captain Walu. Uh, it, it, it's an anarchist ship in many ways, um, in the sense that our organizing is very horizontal, um, but guided um, really by uh, crews that have extensive experience in both break the siege missions um, and also search and rescue in the central med. And there's been a lot of alignment between the search and rescue community vis-a-vis -vis refugee solidarity, asylum seeker support, migrant justice movements, and this, um, uh, and that's something that has come up, I think, in the narrative and discourse around the mission a lot as well. Borders, um, and yeah, and racialized borders, um, externalization of borders, um, yeah, and all of the common strands between movement building globally in this in this really important juncture vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, Palestinian liberation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Quiva. So it sounds amazing. So anyway, you, it's, uh, you know, the, the Freedom Flotilla 
is kind of direct democracy and direct actions, but it's also movement building, education. Yeah. And, and I guess what you're trying to do is when you're ready to set sail to Gaza, you know, I've built this amazing coalition in a way of people, of civil society, of parliamentarians. Um, um, so it's the idea in a way to, to build something that Israel will find it very hard to stop. We're trying to build a political cost for stopping um, and passenger safety. So to try and ensure um, a collective global political response um, if, they, if they plan on attacking the ships. Um, to not repeat 2010 and to not um, face the possibility of lethal force being used um, in that stopping. Um, however, it feels like there's a lot of balls in the air um, and we're trying to conceptualize lots of different strategies that could or could not happen, including one or some of the ships getting into Gaza. Um, and, and what are our scenarios A, Bs and Cs and multiple other ones um, when we feel that already the siege on the Gaza um, has been externalized vis-a-vis -vis the ports that we're now trying to dock in. So we're facing already bureaucratic impediments, port after ports, we're being sent very last minute to very remote ports, um, you know, which, which impacts all of the planning and the organization of local organizing groups and committees. Um, but they've been really adaptable um, and amazingly, you know, supportive um, at really just trying to very last minute sort of rejig lots of logistics, um, which is the nature of ships in general, um, but then specifically this mission. So, so it is in a way, it is not trying to exceptionalize this mission. It is one strategy amongst many, um, you know, that is really trying to work in parallel with the student occupations, um, with the blockades, you know, with BDS committees, um, with the Palestinian diaspora leadership that is going on across the world and has been a real lighthouse to us all in terms of its clarity and courage and consistency um, and unflinching truth telling over the past nine months and 76 years. Um, so it's trying to reassert, um, particularly in terms of territorial integrity um, and the very real possibility that the Israeli occupation remains in control of land crossings in Gaza in coordination with the Egyptian regime in terms of active collaboration and complicity in, in that ceiling, um, but to try and open up that space of imagination for challenging the naval blockade. Um, and it will never be enough in the land crossings. So there has to be pressure to open those without a doubt, because it's a trickle um, in terms of, of humanitarian aid specifically. But this mission is political, obviously, um, as well as humanitarian. And it is really rights-based, justice-rooted. Um, and, and we're hoping, you know, will, as, as much as many other movements are doing so at the moment, open up that space of external and internal freedom in ourselves um, to imagine what it looks like. Um, and also that responds to the fact that Gaza, as you know, as any of us who have spent time in Gaza know, is a community rooted in the sea, the fisher folk, you know, the folk songs, um, the, the food, the relationship, you know, with that sea, which is such a resource for so many and so healing for so many you know, in, in the density of the grief and the horror and the suffering there at the moment. Um, and I also think, I oftentimes think of um, of uh, Bissan, um, our truth-telling beautiful leader, Bissan, um, and her sitting in her car in one of the videos that she posted and her eyes just lit up by the setting sun, the golden hour, um, as, as she just weeps listening to Rim al-Banna, um, speaking about, you know, just, yeah, that rootedness in earth and sea. Um, so, so we're trying to think, you know, of ways of, in a way, not romanticizing, and we're aware, you know, the optics of this ship, you know, it's, it is the activist ship, it's, you know, graffitied and spray painted, and it's adorned with art and children's pictures, and, and it is beautiful. And we don't want to romanticize this, this mission as anything more than it is, which is urgent and desperate, um, and rooted in grief and in love, um, but also rooted in, yeah, just just trying to to collectively keep that space of imagination from contracting 
into these pixelated images and videos of horror that we're all trying to absorb and metabolize through our telephones back into the expansive of movement, mm. a collective movement, and the power of that and the beauty of that as well. I wanted to talk to you about that, actually, because you, um, I mean, you have been part of the free Gaza movement, uh, the Freedom Flotilla, since its birth. You were on one of the ships in 2008 that made it to Gaza, right? 2009, yeah. that made it to, to Gaza. You were one of the very few internationals, as we call ourselves, in Gaza during Operation Cast Lead, which was in 2008-2009. Uh, Operation Cast Lead lasted about three weeks. Uh, I think around 1,400 people died. Uh, it was one of the most horrific assaults on Gaza to date at the time. Um, we, you were volunteering, right, with, um, with um, emergency services like the Red Crescent, uh, um, uh, um, we're now nine months into the most brutal assault uh, by the Israeli apartheid state on the Palestinians ever. Um, so you've experienced this assault, um, the attacks on emergency services, on hospitals, on, on medical facilities, on, on civilians. Um, I, wanted to talk to, I wanted you to talk about this a little bit, because I, not too much, because I, I know how traumatic it is. Uh, but I also wanted to touch upon what you've just said, because a friend of mine called Iman Marifi, she's French, she's a, um, a doctor, she spent some time in Gaza during the recent assault and her. she came back to France saying what we've all felt in Palestine, even if I haven't been to Gaza, I felt it in other parts of Palestine. She said when she came back that she saw the most horrific images, you know, in front of her eyes, you know, children being brought to the hospital with one bullet in their head children dismembered and anyway but she said that she found she found humanity in Gaza and we've all experienced it and the Palestinians have been dehumanized to a level that um, people don't understand how beautiful they are how, I, again I don't want to romant, romanticize them but how beautiful Palestine is and the Palestinian and how, how welcome they are so I wanted you to maybe touch upon actually the feeling of getting in in 2009 with the boat. I remember the images and stuff because, uh, you know, as, as you know, I'd, I was involved and I had lots of friends on, on these boats. I remember Eva and Vic and, and Alberto and, and uh, Eva and others, you know. Uh, so can you talk about this and can you talk about, yeah, the beauty of, of Gaza in a way? Definitely. Um, so I wasn't on the ship that got in. We were on land and we, we welcomed ships that got in. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure. That's why I was there. Yeah, and yeah. then I was on other ships that were attacked. Um, so I got in actually through, uh, through Rafah um, at the time with an Egyptian medical delegation for, for one of the times that, that I entered. Um, during Kastled, I had lived in Gaza before that when we welcomed the other ships. Then I had exited and then Kassled began. Um, and I was on a ship that was rammed by the Israeli Navy. We started taking on water. We eventually had to do an emergency docking in Lebanon. And then I came in with uh, an Egyptian medical delegation across Rapa and then stayed. Um, so I'll, I'll answer some of the strands, I'd say, that were open there. And um, I would just say I... I can't remember if it was reading or listened to the testimony and words of your beautiful French brave French friend and her words encapsulated so much, I think, of what so many of us feel vis-a-vis -vis Gaza 
you know, that it is within all of the horror, it is a lighthouse of humanity beaming, you know, um, and calling to us all in, in all of our little lighthouses, I think across the globe, you know, whether that our students occupying, you know, mobilizing people in the streets, people weeping, you know, um, people, people with their fists in the air, all of it, you know, we are, we are messaging and beaming to each other, but that central lighthouse, I think of love and community and hospitality and endurance, um, and samud and, and sabr, which is a word which cannot only be translated as patience in English because it is something so much deeper and so much more spiritual than that. Um, but the experience of living in, in Gaza was the duality, I think, that your friend attested to um, of both horror and grief and trauma and suffering and also more the, the most intense love and community um, and really self-sacrifice, you know, that that social solidarity, the the depth and the, the strength of that social fabric um, is, I, I, I really can't think of any other equivalent. And I've worked in many communities, also a brave and resilient, and, and that's an overused word, which I don't like, actually, it just popped out, resilience, to put the the responsibility on the backs of people to have to even be resilient in the first place. Um, but I've worked with many, many strong communities in, in motion and movement throughout the world, and all of them hold parts of that. Um, but there is also something quite unique about Gaza. Um, so in answer to your question, uh, one of them I worked with as an ambulance volunteer or accompaniment with many of our mutual friends, our beautiful mutual friends, um, who I hold in mind and spirit here, including Vittorio, um, yeah, and uh, and his beautiful family who have carried his legacy and his memory, you know, in their in their witness and their their activism. Um, but part of that witness was of yes, the horror um, of responding to the massacres and the broken bodies of children and unearthing, you know, survivors from the rubble and the dazed, you know, shock um, and almost gasping of air of people as they came up through the rubble back into life. Um, it was that, um, it was visceral, it was horrific, yes, traumatizing, which is why I ended up training as a psychotherapist afterwards, specifically due to that that experience and, and wanting to be able to better resource for, for um, first responders, search and rescue personnel and paramedics through work. Um, there was that, uh, and there was also the profound braveness or bravery of paramedics and first responders and the profound tenderness. Um, and that was something I think that all of us who spent time in the back of those ambulances, which are to many of us who witnessed that as sacred a place as any place of worship I think I've ever been in. Um, they, they were places of care um, there were places in which, you know, paramedics held the bodies of those um, who were dying in the back of the ambulances with us, um, with the most deep tenderness and love as if they were their children or their elders or their siblings, because they became that in those ambulances. They became, there was no us and them. There was a we to that experience. Um, and that is a community uh, those of those paramedics and first responders that, as you mentioned, is under sustained, um, deliberate and systematic attack. The over 750 Palestinian healthcare workers in Gaza who have been killed or who have suffered life changing injuries, um, not even getting into the psychological, emotional, spiritual trauma, the moral injury of them, you know, going out day after day, first of all, you know, fully aware that they could be killed while responding, and second of all, having to respond day after day to the horror of this, um, you know, to carry those those broken, dismembered bodies of children, and sometimes go home to their own children, then at night, you know, with the very real possibility that when they go out, they could come home to their, their bombed out houses, um, and to their own families, you know, being, being carried by other paramedics. Um, so within all of this, um, one thing that has been really central, both to the organizing of this flotilla, a, a small group of us working on this, but more broadly to responding to the movement building, the movement widening, amazingly, um, yeah, wide 
movement widening that has been going on or urgent or it's hard to come up with words to describe I think just what we're witnessing which feels like a paradigm shift in terms of consciousness that we need to translate into a paradigm shift on a systemic political structural level um, but part of this I think is the duality that everybody's experiencing of this contraction into this absorption of horror through our telephones and then this expansion into the collective, you know, which we're all feeling every time we go out on a demonstration. We were on, we participated in Pride here yesterday um, in a block um, whose, whose mantra, whose chant uh, was no pride in apartheid or no pride in a genocide. Um, and it was, it was rebellious and it was beautiful and there was music and song and again led by Palestinian diaspora organizers, some of them originally from Gaza, um, others from the West Bank, others from 48. Um, and there were so many no's and then there was this collective yes in terms of what we're embracing and trying to step into. Um, but within all of this, I'm also really conscious that people are carrying the vicarious trauma of this, the moral injury, which in some ways I think is a more appropriate term for this because it goes beyond trauma. This is cellular and visceral and spiritual. Um, they're carrying, I think the overwhelm, you know, our collective nervous systems and individual nervous systems on fire because everybody is constantly on. Um, there's very little decompression, there's very little, regulation or co-regulation I think specifically for people maybe who aren't in the presence of children which I know you know as a parent I know as a parent are the ultimate anchor the ultimate calling back into presence um, but within all of that how do we keep ourselves sustainable how do we hold central care or collective care as a central tenant in our political organizing how do we make sure that our exchanges with each other you know, are rooted in that care, the care that we hold for our Palestinian sister and brethren and people, our comrades, um, and then how do we hold that care in terms of our interactions, which sometimes, you know, in activism and in organizing happens, people, um, you know, get abrupt or abrasive in their communication, there's ruptures, there's all of this stuff of, yeah, just human communication, um, but it is really trying to maintain the, the fact that we need to remain intact for this struggle. We need to remain as resourced, as grounded, um, and as focused as possible. And within that focus, I'm just going to, and then I'll stop, but I'm going to offer an analogy um, that has held me in good stead, in, in very regulated and um, steady stead over the past nine months. Um, and that has actually been two things. One, uh, Deanna Butu, I think it was back in October or November, um, spoke about us needing to inhabit a choir of dissent or a choir of resistance, a collective creative resistance. Um, and she spoke about how in any choir, as we're all singing, you know, this narrative of love and resistance and dissent and solidarity, people need to stop and take breath right? And steady themselves, calm themselves, um, focus themselves. And somebody will keep on singing that song. And then when they need to take that breath, somebody else will keep on singing that song and we keep on moving. Um, another analogy has been that of lighthouses, that even within these very tumultuous storms, almost this dark night of humanity, how do we make sure, you know, that these lighthouses keep on beaming hope to each other, keep on messaging, you know, that nobody is alone within this, that we are the majority um, and that we are in a movement which is growing, you know, day by day, just like that heartbeat, you know, that we're all trying to hold steady from Gaza. Um, and there is so much, I think, you know, that people can do on an individual and collective basis. Um, but the first thing is, I think, to listen to the hum humility of our bodies, that 8 billion inhabitants of the plants of the planet share very similar physiology when it comes to trauma, when it comes to stress, and to recognize, you know, that, that we're human, that we're fallible, that we need to, to sleep. You know, sleep can be revolutionary, rest can be revolutionary, as for Audrey Lord, um, and and you know, keep nourished, practically nourished, um, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically nourished, and keep on moving, um, but with clarity and focus. And finally, channel Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. But we gotta remember to float sometimes, you know, just stay, yeah. Hmm. Thanks, Viva. I... <laughs> hey, me too.
this point. No, it's so it's so um, it's so crucial. It's so crucial. The care, the self care. Oh, also, because you know, like we we've been working with some kind of urgency, a sense of urgency for nine months. I'm sure you are as well. You're in like 10 different WhatsApp groups, signal groups. Uh, you work with people you've never worked with before. Um, and I've always, I, I'm going to sound like an old whatever now, but I've always, you know, you, you, you always try to better yourself as, as a person as well and to learn and to, and to learn from your mistakes. And you, and also always starting from the point that whatever someone else is saying, is most probably coming from a very good place, you know, even if you don't agree with it. Um, um, and, and that's sometimes very hard when you work nonstop on, with this sense of urgency, you know, and, um, and it's, uh, you know, Iman, again, um, my uh, like French friend, doctor, um, she's due to go back to Gaza in a few, few days, few weeks. And she said, but this time I understand that what they need is actually not me with a syringe or with a scalp or like you know they need psychological support so i'm just going to go back i'm not going to bring any medical equipment i'm going to go back with coffee sweets uh, little teddy bears and and yeah 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 and and, and, and empathy yeah yeah and yeah. also um what's what's what I've, I've been you know, experienced in the last nine months with young activists, because as you said, it's be, there's been a, a paradigm shift. Yeah. We, we've seen people, um, young, old, but like a lot of new people coming on, you know, on board. And, um, but I've heard many, many times uh, activists saying like, I haven't been out for nine months. I haven't socialized. I haven't been to a birthday. I've refused to go for drinks. I refuse to go to the cinema. I can't do it while Gaza is burning. And trying to tell them, no, you need to do that for yourself and also for Gaza, because the people of Gaza, you know, wouldn't like to see you cry every day. You, 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 you're privileged in a way. I've observed a lot of that. Shame is a heavy word, but I'm going to use it. But vis-a-vis -vis people feeling that they can also inhabit spaces of, of anything resembling joy over the last nine months. Um, and I think it brings up a lot of cognitive dissonance um, in people, you know, transitioning from this very intense organizing environments, the urgency of it, the gravitas of it, to social environments that that don't reflect or don't mirror, you know, the intensity of that, the focused nature of that. Um, but I do think it's really important, even if sort of going out to, you know, a party or something feels a step too far to gather together in people of joint focus, um, you know, and, and in a way of common purpose and to do beautiful things, cook food, eat nourishing things, listen to music, be in presence with each other in, in a milieu that isn't just organizing, you know, having that downtime, that decompression, that conversations in which vulnerabilities can come out, you know, as well as the courage, as well as the strength, you know, the collective power, um, but in which people can also express the fragilities, you know, that are emerging in people, that that we can own the cracks as well um, and, and not hold or carry any shame around that. And I don't think we have to look very far than the communities that we're trying to accompany, you know, in this struggle in terms of a really rooted practice. And I think of that, we were on a really powerful pride demonstration here in Lisboa yesterday, um, in which the slogan in the block, the Palestinian block and allies that we were that we were marching um, was no pride in apartheid or no pride in genocide. Um, and amongst that were first and second generation Palestinians, intergenerational, including the mother of an amazing academic and activist um, from the West Bank here, Dima, um, and her mother, you know, was was scoping continually, you know, and I was I was observing her, observing everybody else, um, but making sure that everybody was well, everybody was hydrated, you know, the the offerings that came out of people's canvas bags of mamul and you know fruit and nuts because we were walking for hours, um, and then there was a couple of provocateurs on the demonstration, um, 
and immediately it's almost instinctually this group of Palestinians themselves, you know, most at risk vis-a-vis -vis racialized borders and immigration status. And they immediately form this, this flank, you know, of care and protection around some of the younger participants um, on the march. Um, and, and in a way, you know, in order to make this sustainable, when we think of, um, you know, the adages that we all have to, to hold and inhabit, there is so much wisdom, you know, if we look to organizers and movements that have preceded us, I think oftentimes to, you know, the years that I spent in Chiapas in Mexico, you know, that, that, that was a struggle also so rooted in earth and care and community. Um, so yes, I think we really have to, um, you know, expand into the collective um and and in a way i think you know really try and deconstruct what is a really internalized i find quite corporate understanding of labor and productivity and you know and that somehow not sleeping is a virtue as opposed to the fact that rest is revolutionary as per audrey lord um and Palestine needs us intact. And so do our people, our families need us intact, our loved ones need us intact. Um, and that we're not doing anybody a service by having one more you know, person burning out and, and navigating the shame and the isolation of carrying that individually, as opposed to saying collectively, we collectively resource and we keep on going, you know, and we make this sustainable um, and we make it real, you know, it has to be rooted in in real life and real community and real human relationships. Definitely. Thanks, Kriva. It's 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 so crucial. It's so crucial, and and um, and I understand why people might think that we don't really have time to focus on this because the ur urgency is, is Gaza burning. But um, I think it's also crucial that people understand that um, you know. I've tattooed this on my wrist years ago. I don't know if you can see it actually, or if it's the struggle will be endless. And 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 people don't understand the meaning of this. When when they read this, they go, "Oh, this is so depressing." But actually, for me, it's the opposite. You know, the okay. struggle. I mean, Howard Zinn, you know, the late U.S. Yeah. historian, um, was saying that the struggle needs to be exhilarating and joyful as well and we need to embrace it and and also it's crucial in my opinion because like how if we all look depressed sleep deprived unhealthy who is going to want to join us <laughs> you know what i mean like it, it's also about making people feel welcome and making people understand Valued. that the struggle it's so is so beautiful you know, yes. and the struggle to be a better person, woman, man, you know, uh, is, is also very important because, um, I mean, you, you know this better than anyone. And um, I've met, you know, you like through your life, you, you, you create relationships, you, you, you meet, meet new friends. But the friends I've, I've made since I, I, I became truly engaged in the political like struggle for social justice it's a different kind of friendship you know it's like brotherhood and sisterhood it's it's completely different and with it's it's so beautiful bonding sorry it's a, sorry <laughs> i said with a little pinch of trauma bonding in there but oh yeah, my god yeah yeah, yeah. It's so deep so deep yeah, yeah. you face collectively the potentiality of your own mortality it shifts things, it shifts priorities, mm. it, you know, and, and I think the quality and nature of those friendships and relationships and community, while also holding space for, you know, other environments of social peace and quote unquote normalcy, and it's okay to pivot in and out of those spaces. Um, mm. And I think just specifically vis-a-vis -vis your comment of community and, you know, many of our comrades and friends made over the years now bringing their children into this movement. Um, I was thinking recently, we were at another event here in Lisbon and a lovely friend and comrade of us both, Stefan Christophe and his compañera and little child whom I had just met for the first time came in and she was amazing and just this beautiful, radiant, like Noor, you know, just this this face of yeah, such preciousness. And, you know, and she's a toddler and she was making noise. And 
and it really and and I could see there is this instinct sometimes in our meetings because they're all very serious, not to open them up, you know, for for them to be authentically multi generational, like movements like in Palestine, like in indigenous movements throughout the world. And I I I gave them big hugs and uh, told them a quote that really helped me when I had my child um, integrate him into my political life, which was by a feminist sociologist, and she said, "Children's noise." quote unquote, is the sound of our movements growing. Um, and I really think we have to hold that tenant vis-a-vis -vis children, but also vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the complexity of all of us as human beings, bring in all of those parts um, and not continually be in only one, you know, quite rigid role of activism, but have subversive humor, have care, have fragility and vulnerability and courage and tenacity and endurance and flow in and out of these spaces, you know, that, 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 we don't have to replicate the structures that we're trying to resist. Um, you know, that that few people is expendable. Nobody is expendable. We leave nobody behind. We carry all of us with all of our complexities with us, hopefully to a free Palestine and also to a free us. You know, this is this is a collective global struggle that is that is becoming an analytical lens for all of these young and older folks who have joined this movement. Um, to be able to analyze all of the systems around us that are broken um, and toxic and and failing people um, and the interconnectivity, the intersectionality, and also, you know, the fact that that it, it is all one. Um, and we have it. We witnessed that yesterday on the demonstration. Um, and I think we're all witnessing that, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the conversations have dropped so much deeper in the last nine months. Um, and the cost is so high for this paradigm shift, so brutally high. Um, and I think, yes, we're failing in some ways not to translate all of this beautiful energy and focus and dynamism into getting one ambulance into a refugee camp under fire, into preventing the death of one beautiful, precious, irreplaceable Palestinian life. Um, but we keep on going. And yes, this movement and this struggle is endless and we'll have different iterations. And as all we know, as we all know, post whatever liberation eventually comes, whatever freedom comes, the work doesn't stop there. You know, yeah. humanity and all of its complexity continues. Um, and we try and remain focused and consistent, I think always. And caring. All of the things. <laughs> Kriva, it's such a, a, a beautiful way to, to wrap up. Um, it's, um, yeah, thank you. And um, it's funny, after all we've talked about, I was going to say, I wish I was with you in, in Lisbon. And part of it is true. And part of it, I'm also quite happy to be here with my kids and you know so it's this duality that we need to totally and you yeah, are yeah. and we are there mm. and, and yeah, yeah. sharing everybody you know and that's yeah. a beautiful thing you know about this it's it's in the name of everyone and and you're doing mm. things in the name of all of us and and we're yeah. all you know worker bees muhammad ali's so <laughs> doing our thing um with a feminist ethic and ethos of care and yeah. i think that is central to it all Yeah. Shukran. <laughs> Bye, Kuiva. Big hugs to the Bye. family and to all of them you're in. Same. Bye. Be well.